Hey everyone, I hope you're doing well and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, what we do on Unfortunate Ends is talk about a variety of things including crime, mystery, assassinations and sometimes even executions. So if you're interested in this type of content, be sure to stick around. Anyway, let's jump into today's case. Stanford White was one of the most influential architects of his time, designing a variety of famous buildings, notably the Triumphal Arch at Washington Square. Yet, there was a sinister and wicked side to him, and as a result, Stanford was murdered by the millionaire Harry Kendall Thor over his relationship with Harry's wife, the actress Evelyn Nesbitt. His murder would lead to the court case, which was dubbed the Trial of the Century. Stanford White was born on the 9th of November 1853 in New York City to his father Richard Grant White, a Shakespearean scholar, journalist, social critic and lawyer, and his mother, Alexina Black Mees. With no formal architectural training, Stanford began his career as an architect at the age of 18, as an assistant to Henry Hobson Richardson. Richardson was considered the greatest American architect of the time and created the style recognised today as Richardsonian Romanesque. He remained in this position with Richardson for six and a half years, before embarking on a year and a half trip to Europe in 1878 to study architecture. When Stanford returned to New York in September 1879, he partnered with architects Charles Fuller McKim and William Rutherford Mead to form the architectural firm McKim, Mead and White. As part of the partnership, all commissions designed by the architects were identified as being the work of the collective firm, not any individual architect. Then in 1884, Stanford married 22-year-old Bessie Spring Smith. Together, Stanford and Bessie had a son, Lawrence Grant White, who was born in 1887. In 1889, Stanford designed the Triumphal Arch at Washington Square. The arch was initially meant to be temporary, however, it was so popular that eventually money was raised to construct a permanent version. He also designed a long series of houses for the rich, as well as numerous public, institutional and religious buildings. Today he is remembered for many of these works, such as the Madison Square Garden, the Washington Memorial Arch, the New York Herald Building, as well as many others. Stanford also designed many more pieces, and not only for New York. He was a versatile artist who designed jewellery, furniture and a wide range of interior decorations on top of his famous buildings and structures. Just like the Triumphal Arch in Washington Square, many of Stanford's architectural pieces still stand today. Stanford was evidently an extremely gifted architect, however, there was a more sinister side to him as he was a serial seducer of teenage girls. Mark Twain would later write about Stanford that New York society had known for years that the married white was eagerly and diligently and ravenously and remorselessly hunting young girls to their destruction. Stanford owned a multi-story apartment on the 24th street in Manhattan. This apartment has a rear entrance and was designed for one purpose, to act as a seductive layer where Stanford and his female conquests could wine and dine in privacy. One room was even fitted with a red velvet swing that hung from the ceiling. This was used for young women, including model Evelyn Nesbitt, who would provide entertainment for Stanford in various degrees of undress. Yet little did Stanford know at that time that this would lead to his death. On the 25th of June 1906, when Stanford was 52 years of age, he was murdered at Madison Square Garden by millionaire Harry Kendall Thor. Harry was the jealous husband of Evelyn Nesbitt, with whom Stanford had a love affair. Stanford's presence at the Roof Garden Theatre of Madison Square Garden had been a last minute decision, with his original plans to travel to Philadelphia for business being postponed when his son made an unexpected trip to New York. Stanford and his son 
dined at St. Martin's, a restaurant near the garden. Harry and his wife Evelyn also dined at that same restaurant that night. Harry claimed to have seen Stamford there. After dinner, Stamford and his son headed to the theatre to watch that evening's theatrical presentation, the premiere performance of Mademoiselle Champagne. During the show's finale, I Could Love a Million Girls, Harry approached Stamford and produced a pistol. Standing only two feet away from his target, Harry said to Stamford, You have ruined my wife. He then fired three shots at Stamford, hitting him twice in the face and once in his upper left shoulder. These shots killed Stamford instantly. Part of Stamford's face was torn away from the impact of the two shots, and the rest of his features were blackened by gunpowder, leaving his face unrecognisable. The crowd initially thought the shooting had been a party trick and began to cheer, as elaborate party tricks were common among the upper class of New York society at the time. However, when it became apparent that Stanford was dead, hysteria spread. Harry, a Pittsburgh millionaire, had a history of severe mental instability and was a jealous husband who saw Stanford as a threat. When Evelyn was 16 and Stanford 47, he had intoxicated her with alcohol and then sexually assaulted her while unconscious. Following on from this incident, Stanford upheld a strong presence in Evelyn's life. However, at the time of his murder, Stanford had moved on to other lovers, though some of these were underage and would be better described as his victims, and was also unaware of Harry's long-standing grudge against him. Stanford's son, 19-year-old Lawrence White, struggled with an overwhelming amount of grief for the murder of his father, even blaming himself for his death. Lawrence would say that, if only he had gone to Philadelphia. Years later, Lawrence would bitterly write that, on the night of June 25th, 1906, while attending a performance at Madison Square Garden, Stanford White was shot from behind by a crazed profligate whose great wealth was used to tarnish his victim's memory during the series of notorious trials that followed. Following his death, Stanford was buried in St. James, New York. After this, the murder of Stanford White led to an infamous court case which was dubbed the Trial of the Century by contemporary reporters. The news of Stanford's death quickly made newspaper headlines everywhere, with some calling it the Trial of the Century. During Stanford's trial, few friends or associates came forward to publicly defend him. His closest friend, Augustus St. Gardens, was gravely ill and unable to speak out. The two-year-long trial started on the 23rd of January 1907. During the first trial, eyewitness Warner Paxson describes the shooting to the jury. Warner also explained how he led Harry out of the theatre to a police officer. Whilst leading Harry out of the theatre, Warner claims that he explained, I did it because he ruined my wife, to which his wife responded, Yes Harry, but look at the fix you're in now. Harry replied to Evelyn, I have probably saved your life. During the trial coroner, Timothy Kahane testified that Stanford died instantly from a cerebral hemorrhage as a result of the pistol wounds in the skull. The first who came forward to defend Harry was DCC Wiley, his family psychiatrist. Dr. Wiley testified that the murder was an act of an insane man and that Harry's comment to his wife immediately after the shooting, I have probably saved your life, was an indication of this insane delusion. Next to take the stand was Benjamin Bowman, a doorkeeper at Madison Square Garden. Benjamin testified that, in December 1903, Evelyn left the theatre with Harry and because of this, Stanford pulled a pistol from his pocket and muttered, I will find him and kill him before daylight. Benjamin also said that he warned Harry of Stanford's threat and that Harry became black in the face with anger. By this point in the trial, it was clear that the defence attorney, John Gleason, was outmatched and so he withdrew from the case. 
following which Delvin Delmas of San Francisco, who was famous for having never lost a case, now replaced him. With this new appointment, the defence strategy changed. Instead of focusing on Harry's alleged madness, the new attorney worked to make the jury hate Stanford so much that they could forgive Harry for the murder. No one was in a better position to make the jury despise Stanford than Harry's wife, Evelyn. The public was eager to hear Evelyn's testimony. Evelyn took to the stand on the 8th of February that same year. In two hours of an often tearful testimony, Evelyn told everyone gathered at the courtroom her version of the events that occurred on the night of the murder. Evelyn also told the witnesses of the night that Harry had proposed marriage. Evelyn claimed that she began to cry and after Harry's begging, she told him the whole story about Stanford and her first sexual encounter with him. Whilst telling the jury this, Evelyn was so overwhelmed, she fell back in her chair, collapsed and murmured, I can't go on, I can't, I can't. After being looked at by a doctor, Evelyn finished her story. Telling the jury of what had happened that evening, Arthur drinking champagne in Stanford's apartment. The last to take the stand as the defence's witness was Harry's mother, Mrs. William Thor. She testified that Stanford sent her son spinning into a downward emotional spiral. She said that Harry repeatedly blamed Stanford, who he called the worst man in New York, and who had ruined his life. She told the jury that Stanford caused her son to spend countless sleepless nights sobbing in bed. Jury discussions began at 5.15pm on April 10th, 1907. They lasted for 47 hours before the jury returned to the courtroom to announce that it was hopelessly deadlocked. A mistrial was then declared and the jury was dismissed. The second trial started on the 9th of January 1908. This trial was less sensational, attracted less attention, and was more predictable in its outcome than the first. This time, instead of attacking Stanford, the defence attorney focused on proving his client Harry absolutely insane. Mrs. William Thor testified not only about her son's strange behaviour, but also about epileptic and crazed uncles who ended up in asylums. Harry's household nurse, who took care of him when he was only three or four years old, testified that he was moody, nervous, and had frequent spells during which he stared, twitched his mouth, threw himself back and howled. Harry's kindergarten teacher remembered that Harry would tear off his clothes, throw chairs against the wall, and spend his energy on inanimate things. She testified that after three years of dealing with Harry, she told his mother that the child had a peculiar brain. Doctors testified that they had diagnosed Harry to be suffering from mania, paranoia, and other diseases of the mind. It seemed that Harry suffered from maniac depressive insanity. On the 1st of February 1908, Harry was found not guilty due to insanity and committed to a mental institution. It was declared that his discharge would be dangerous to public safety, and he was sent to the Matia One State Hospital for the criminally insane. In June 1915, seven years later, a jury gathered in the Supreme Court of New York to determine if Harry was now sane enough to be released from the mental institution. Evelyn offered no testimony during this trial. The jury found Harry sane and two days later, he was a free man. This was short-lived though. With Evelyn having lost feelings for Harry, their marriage only survived a few more months. In 1917, Harry severely whipped a 19-year-old boy and was arrested, and again returned to the insane asylum, where he stayed until 1924. He died of a heart attack in Miami in 1947 at the age of 76. The autopsy report for Stanford, made public by the coroner's testimony at the Thor trial, revealed that Stanford was seriously ill at the time of his murder. It was discovered that 
if not murdered, he would have probably passed away shortly from the any number of diseases he was suffering from at the time. These diseases were Bright's disease, incipient tuberculosis and severe liver deterioration. He was 52 at the time of his death. Thank you so much everyone for watching this video on Stanford White. Let me know what you thought of the case and the trial down below in the comments. And if you have any suggestions, be sure to leave them down in the comments. And there's also links to my Instagram and to my email down in the description. So you can send me any suggestions there also. I hope you guys have notifications turned on. So you get all my videos as soon as I upload them. Anyway, that's all from me. So I'll see all of you in the next unfortunate end. Thanks.